Well, the wanderer is an old English elegy that offers a very interesting glimpse into the Anglo-Saxon imagination, including the religious imagination. It's a song of intense longing, um, spiritual longing, uh, this sense of isolation, longing even for the domestic and social worlds in which the speaker has left behind. The speaker is very interesting because he's not, he doesn't have the posture of someone standing up before an audience like the Beowulf poet, it's, it, or, or Cadmon's hymn. There's not this performative call to action. This is actually an internal monologue, and so it's very introspective. The speaker is trying to make sense of this isolation within the framework of wisdom. So in a way, it's a, it's a wisdom poem that, that tends to make sense of suffering within this larger scheme that's somewhat suggestively Christian. In the description below, I have a link to a translation that was published in 1918 by Cossett Newton and Stith Thompson. Well, I like this translation because it preserves the Anglo-Saxon meter. So you see it here. It begins, and it's got the lines separated according to Anglo-Saxon poetics. You've got the two feet on one side, two feet on, on the other, and the entire line is bound by alliteration. Often the lonely one longs for honors. So notice how it begins. This is very typical of Old English elegies. This portion here. Often the lonely one longs for honors. That word longs in Old English, gebieten, is very important. You see it all throughout, not just the wanderer, but also the wife's lament, the seafarer, and other uh, lyric poems in Old English. Often the lonely one longs for honors, the grace of God, though grieved in his soul over the waste of the waters far and wide he shall row with his hands through the rhyme cold sea and rhyme by the way was uh, it's an archaic word for uh, this this hoarfrost that would cover objects in the cold travel the exile tracks full determined is fate or full fixed is fate uh, this idea of fate, very important to the elegies and the Anglo-Saxon imagination broadly. It's another word. Uh, their word for it is weird, which is where we get the word weird, and that'll come up soon. Again, also, this idea of the exile. Uh, these are people who are very interested, at least in their poetic productions, in the state of exile, which fits in very comfortably within the Christian uh, religious ethos that characterized the Anglo-Saxon writing. Um, in, you know, the 8th, 9th, and 10th centuries. So the wanderer spake, his woes remembering, his, mis his misfortunes in fighting, and the fall of his kinsmen. And so it begins. Of course, in the Old English original manuscripts, we don't have the quotation marks, so it's ambiguous where the speaking begins and where it ends. Uh, this all could be part of what's spoken by the wanderer, uh, but it also could begin here. And of course, Newton and Thompson uh, make that editorial decision. You'll see that um, made in different ways in different translations. Often alone at early dawn I make my moan. And there's something about the early dawn for the Anglo-Saxons which is particularly melancholic. The wife in the wife's lament is seen to be wandering beneath the elms at dawn. I don't know if you've been awake or walking in the forest right before dawn. It's kind of dreary, it's kind of lonely, and it's got this forlorn feeling uh, to it. And I think that that's, that's something that's very integral to the, the Anglo-Saxon mind. Not a man lives now to whom I can speak forth my heart and soul and tell of its trials. Notice the, the need to speak forth. Putting in today's terms, trauma survivors will need to repeat the story. You see this in literature all the time. Something terrible has happened. There's this compulsion to speak. And though no one is listening, he's speaking it. You, know, you might think of uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge's The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, where the mariner with his, his skinny hand, he stops the wedding guest and he must tell his story of shipwreck, of what happened. There's the same compulsion driving the lyric utterance here. In truth I know well, 
that there belongs to a lord an illustrious trait to fetter his feelings fast in his breast, to keep his own counsel, though cares oppress him. The weary in heart against weird has no help. And weird comes up in the Beowulf poem, it comes up in the Old English elegies. It's this North Germanic kind of pagan idea of fate, which actually blends pretty nicely with Christian ideas of, of predeterminism and predestination. But weird, that's where we get the word weird from. So in Shakespeare's Macbeth, when, when the script refers to the witches as the three weird sisters, it's, it's meant not so much in the modern sense of weird as strange or outlandish. It's, in this, it's also accommodating this very archaic sense of weird as having to do with fate, having to do with something that's predetermined, uh, something that will happen, the events which are beyond the control of human volition nor may the troubled in thought attempts to get aid. So, um, therefore the Thane who is thinking of glory binds his heart, his bitterest thoughts. This is a voice of someone in absolute isolation. Skipping down a bit, and now he begins to make a distinction between people, you know, the wise man knows. The characteristics of a lord, for example, who has an illustrious trait is one who is one who can keep his own counsel though cares oppress him here we're getting another characteristic the tried man one who's been through trials knows how stern is sorrow how distressing a comrade for him who has few of uh, friends and loved ones he trails the tracks of exile i love that no treasure has he but heart chilling frost no fame upon the earth you can begin to get a sense of the austerity of the exilic imagination of the of the Anglo-Saxons in their poetry. And he, he sings of his sorrows more than heavier grows the grief of his heart, sad after his dream, his sorrows renew. His kinsman's memory he calls to mind and eagerly greets it. In gladness he sees his valiant comrades, then they vanish away. In the soul of a sailor, no songs burst forth, no familiar refrains. Fresh is his care who sends his soul o'er the sea full oft, over the welling waves, his wearied heart. So this is someone on the sea, you know, this nautical and longing. Um, and, you know, this has lasted, this has really resonated with a lot of people. And you can, you can imagine how it will continue to be read. This poem, even the seafarer, you can imagine some future space voyager, you know, reciting this and feeling the, the austerity of, of this cosmic sense of, of isolation and alienation within space. It's very comparable to the isolation and alienation this one feels, this sailor feels um, at sea. But then we, we begin to move into a wisdom mode. It's not just... It's not just an elegy of just lament. It seeks to make sense of this and to place it into a wider or larger meaning. Hence I may not marvel when I am mindful of life that my sorrowing soul grows sick and dark when I look at the lives of lords and earls, how they are suddenly snatched from the seats of their power and their princely pride. So passes this world and droops and dies each day and hour and then here comes the wisdom bit. No man is sage who knows not his share of winter in the world. And now we get these brief, terse, laconic statements made in positive. The wise man is passionate, not too hot in his heart, nor too hasty in words, nor too weak in war, nor unwise in his rashness, not too forward nor fain, nor fearful of death, nor too eager, or nor too eager and arrogant, till he equal his boasting. The wise man will wait with his words of boasting, till restraining his thoughts, he thoroughly he thoroughly knows where his vain words of vaunting eventually will lead him. The sage man perceives how sorrowful it is when all the wealth of the world lie wasted and scattered. Interesting, this, 
idea of wait and gebidden, the Anglo-Saxon word for longing, also means waiting. It can mean waiting, and so it contains the sense of not just expectation, but a, a, a condition of receptivity in a way. If you have this idea of fortune, the leveler, lords and earls are suddenly snatched from their seats of power. There's the fragility of the social order um, or the individual standing within the social order since it's always tra- changing hands. Um, the passing of the world, each thing droops and dies and there's this inevitability. That's It's really an explication of the sense of weird in the world. And then skipping down, so was wasted this world through the wisdom of God to the proud one's pleasure has perished utterly. And the old work of giants stands worthless and joyless. And we have this beautiful song that's ending the, the poem. And you might recognize it. He who the waste of this wallstead wisely considers and looks down deep at the darkness of life, mournful in mind, remembers of old much struggle and spoil, and speaks these words. Where are the horses? Where are the heroes? Where are the high-treasured givers? Where are the proud pleasure-seekers? Where are the palace and its joys? Alas, the bright wine cup. Alas, the burning warriors. Alas, the prince's pride. How passes the time under the shadow of night? As it had never been. It was this incisive questioning into the condition of human life and its transience, but it's also picked up by Tolkien, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, in Lord of the Rings. It's in the, the Two Towers. A scene where the, the people of Rohan are singing a song, and, and by the way, the Rohirrim were, were um, modeled off of the Anglo-Saxons. Uh, Tolkien actually did that, and so there's this, there's this song in chapter 6, King of the Golden Hall, where the writers of the Mark, they begin to sing. And Aragorn translates it. It thus runs in the common speech, said Aragorn, as near as I can make it. Where now is the horse and the rider? Where is the horn that was blowing? Where is the helm and the hauberk and the bright hair flowing? Where is the hand on the harp string and the red fire glowing? Where is the spring and the harvest and the tall corn growing? They have passed like rain on the mountain, like a wind in the meadow. Now notice the dactyls here, the trochees, the variation between iambic and trochaic, dactylic and anapestic. Um, it's very Anglo-Saxon, this is translation itself, at least in its metrics. The days have gone down in the west behind the hills into shadow. Now, this is very elegiac, Tolkien's poem here. Who shall gather the smoke of the dead wood burning, or behold the flowing years from the sea returning? So even we even have the themes of transience, of of this persistent questioning of the dead wood burning, of the cycle of life, and also of the sea. So it's very, very Anglo-Saxon, and that's just a little vestige of the Old English that Tolkien preserved there in his fantasy. And it comes up in other interesting places, too, within the history of Rohan. Anyway, so that's that's one way that this poem has kind of lived on. Um, some scholars think that Keats's Hyperion is, uh, portions of Keats's Hyperion is um, taken from this poem itself. You might think of um, even Keats's, uh, what's the other one? Endymion. Where, where he says, and onward to another city speeds, but this is human life, the wars, the deeds, the disappointments, the anxieties. And so Keats is also kind of tapping into this imagination, which very archaic, very English, of course, old English, but it's within the roots and the textures of poetry that has lived on. So, but there's consolation here. We started in a moment of intense pain, suffering, longing, and isolation, and the poem is attempting to make sense and to bring us about into some kind of consolation or to make some wisdom out of this condition. And in conclusion, we have this homiletic mode. So says the sage, one in mind, as he sits and secretly ponders, good is the man who is true to his trust. 
never should he betray anger, divulge the rage of his heart till the remedy he knows that quickly will quiet his spirit. The quest of honor is a noble pursuit. Glory be to God on high who grants us our salvation. So, in a way, he's made suffering, the states of exilic longing, a prerequisite for wisdom. And then he's also framed this in the end within um, a a Christian framework, um, a Christian ethos. And it could be that this last section was added on by a monk or a pious scribe, uh, but it, it really fits in, I think, somewhat seamlessly within the poem because the poem is already tending in this direction so that by the time we get to the end, um, it, it doesn't seem obtrusive to, to add this bit of, of wisdom here. But it, but it does take us very far from the place where we were in the beginning in isolation and alienation. Um, although the condition is still true, the relation or the posture of a human being within the suffering has been enabled to look up or out at least. That's an interesting movement that this poem is making. It's a great elegy. You should uh, check out other versions as well and read the whole thing because it's great. Thanks for watching and until next time.